Welcome to Framework Fortune and welcome back Framework Fortune community. I'm your host Ben and I'm going to be doing an experimental video today and I'm going to react not to cat videos or music videos but economic videos. And if you guys like this content, me reacting to these debates and stuff like this, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and let me know down in the comments and say more reactions. Now I'm going to be going through this. This is a debate between Peter Schiff. If you don't know who Peter Schiff is, he's a gold bug, has his own gold and silver bullion company, uh, also has an investment company. He called the 2008 housing market crash. He's been calling for another huge crash. If you've been following me for a while, I've been saying similar things to him for about two years now. And we both have, you know, always get... Uh, it's, rain the skies fall and the sky is falling or we're fear mongering or whatever but no if you have a real understanding of economics or at least the austrian classic economics then you know that this stuff is going to start happening when you see the signs it's pretty clear so we're going to get into it he's debating wolf which is a known socialist and a very intelligent guy and another fella that I do not know, I've not heard of him or seen him, but we'll see what they get into. One thing I do want to say, this interview, this debate is only like 22 minutes long of this whole video. So we're not going to go through and course watch the whole entire part because there's some talking from the people who put this on. Shout out to them for getting those three gentlemen together for a discussion right now in this country. That is very important and very rare to have people with opposing views civilly sit down for some discourse and we need to see more of it so kudos to all of them for making this happen and keeping it pretty civil but let's jump in here and see what they're talking about or the country would risk defaulting on its debt altogether but this fight is really nothing new that's right the decision to raise or change the definition of the debt ceiling has been made by congress 78 times just in the last 60 years and yeah. while republicans have been the ones resisting it this year the overwhelming majority of those changes have actually been made while a republican was in the white house in fact the national debt hasn't hit zero since the andrew jackson administration in the 1830s but major events such as so think about that for a second. She said that the national debt has never hit zero since the 1830s. <laughs> Off of that alone, that tells you that government cannot do a good job. They can't handle money. We, we've not seen one example of a big government able to handle money. And that just goes to show you that. That's almost 200 years where we've been in debt in this country. World War II, 9-11 and the Great Recession have added to it significantly over the years. And many may remember when the national debt hit $1 trillion for the first time back in 1981. The Ronald Reagan administration combined an increase in defense spending with tax cuts. The deficit decreased slightly under the... Now I do want to pull back here. Events that driven U.S. public debt growth. World War II, September 11th and 2008 uh, Great Recession. So the, this is what they're blaming the debt growth on, but you got to look deeper than just saying that. 2008, why was 2008 a Great Recession? It was because of failed policies and Wall Street using a lot of margin, a lot more money than they had, causing that crash and mortgages, the mortgage system, the banking system, giving out money to anybody at that time, like kind of like what we're seeing now. Actually, exactly what we're seeing now, where they're giving it out at super low interest rates so anybody can get it. You know, they've got programs for even people with bad credit who can buy houses. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac are still around. They were the, some of the cause of the Great Recession. A lot of, lot of stuff. Same thing World War II. Well, why did we go to war? Why did we go to war? You know that the military industrial complex made a lot of money during World War II and continues to make a lot of money to this day through all these wars that we have. Now, the September 11 terrorist attacks, I mean, that could, I mean, that did have a little effects on the economy, but not as big as an effect as World War II, Great Recession. But let's just let's scroll back up here. 
fully understand how the national debt impacts the country, we have to look at where it stands compared to our gross domestic product. Now, last year's spending in response to the pandemic brought the debt to GDP ratio to 105%, marking its highest point since World War II. But if we go back to the 1990s, we'll find that the ratio stood under 50%, even dropping down to 30% under the Clinton administration. The debt to GDP ratio was... Okay, so I'm going to stop it here for people who are new to economics. When you're talking about debt to GDP ratio, GDP is the growth domestic product. You can basically look at it as money coming in. You know, I like to break things down and keep it simple. So your debt is, of course, going to be money that's going out. You're borrowing money and spending that money. So your domestic product is the money that you're making that's coming in to pay the debt. Well, we're basically 105% debt to asset ratio right now is what she's saying. Insane, but let's go ahead and let it continue. 45% Whatever. by the time George W. Bush left office and by the time Obama left office, it had skyrocketed to nearly 75% as the continued increase in defense spending combined with the government's response to the Great Recession. So who owns all of this debt? The two largest entities are actually right here in the United States. The Social Security Trust Fund and the Federal Reserve. That's public. That's the debt of the people. Now, beyond that, China... So the Social Security holds the most of our debt, so there's no money in there for Social Security. China and Japan both own more than $1 trillion in U.S. Treasury securities, followed by the U.K., Ireland, Luxembourg, and Brazil. So what is the significance of all of this debt and what would it mean if the U.S. were to actually default? Well, joining us now to discuss our Professor Richard Wolf, host of the Economic Update, Peter Schiff, Chief Economist at Euro Pacific Capital, and Steve King, the Economics Professor of Patreon. It's great. So, yeah, this is this is Wolf, Socialist, Peter Schiff, the capitalist and another socialist. I, like I said, I've never heard of this guy. Uh, but we'll see what he talks Great to about have here. you all on the show today. And Professor Wolf, I want to start with you. Now, when we look at the way the debt has grown, have we just come to expect that Congress will continue to spend more as time goes on at this point? Yes, I mean, basically, we have waltzed ourselves into a kind of corner from which it is too dangerous to try to escape. Uh, the debts are so enormous at this point. And by the way, not just the federal debt, but corporate debt and individual household debt, that even the effort to raise interest rates a little bit uh, becomes a risk and a shock that an already troubled economy can really not cope with. So that we are in a situation where we have to keep funding a debt, even though it becomes more dangerous as we do so. And, and Peter, when we look at... Now, everything you said there is accurate. I don't disagree with any of that. You know, you start off, you get in debt, and you take out more debt to pay that debt. It's an endless cycle, and you're just going to cause more issues and more issues. So, And a lot of the that. reasons the national debt has jumped over the years. Which, by the way, if an economic socialist is saying that and agrees with the capitalist on that point, which I'm sure Peter Schiff will probably agree on a lot of that, then you know it's bad out here. It seems there's always something, whether it's the Great Recession, World War II, a global pandemic, or even the war on terror. In some capacity, do you ever see this spending being justified based on current events? Well, first of all, you know, the debt continues in good times as well as bad. We never have any surpluses when times are good to pay off the deficits we incur when, when times are bad. Yeah, and they said that in the beginning. They said we haven't had a surplus since 1834. So, But I want to correct a couple of mistakes that you made earlier on with, with the debt. First of all, the debt to GDP, it's actually 125%, not 105%, because the 105% doesn't count the debt held by the Social Security Trust Fund. So when you count all the debt that's outstanding, it's 125 But that doesn't even tell the whole picture. Because you have to look at the state government debt and all the municipalities, because everybody is looking at the ta same tax base to repay the debt. So when you measure all government debt in the United States, you're looking at 140 percent, 445 percent of GDP. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, because it doesn't count any of the unfunded liabilities of the United States government. 
Those are commitments to pay things like Social Security or Medicare benefits or guaranteed student loans. And when you add all that together, you're talking about several hundred times the GDP uh, of how much we've, we've, we've run up in debt. And the problem, contrary to what everybody is talking about, the problem isn't the debt ceiling. The problem is the debt. The problem is we keep raising the ceiling, so we keep on piling on more debt. Now, Steve, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. I know we've talked. Now, that seems like common sense. That's exactly what I was saying. You know, you keep spending and spending to fix problems, but you keep going more and more into debt. You know, it's not, you're not doing anything. You're just causing more problems. So you can see both the capitalist Peter Schiff and the socialist Wolf agree that there is some problems with the debt in this country and the government spending. Uh, but let's see what this guy's going to say. Talked about how the national debt has grown and how those figures just continue to grow. Of course, when you do take the time to factor everything in, is this something that you see as just inevitably continuing to grow, especially the way that Congress is operating right now? Uh, if you want to continue having a capitalist economy, yes, it has to grow. And this is the this is the reason why I find some of this alarm quite laughable, frankly. Now, I stopped it right here because the first thing he said, if you want to continue to have a capitalist economy, big government, a huge government that spends $30 trillion of debt and trying to spend more, there's nothing capitalist about that. This market is also regulated to hell. We have the PDT rule. If you're a day trader, you know, a regulation that really hurts the smaller traders and only benefits the big institutions. Uh, there's all kinds of regulations throughout the market. So it's not a free market. It's not capitalism. It's a mix of big government and capitalism, which you get crony capitalism. So I don't know if Peter Schiff's going to correct him on that, but he should because that is not accurate. Uh, because I'll, I'll take one of Peter's figures about the level of government debt being 145% of GDP before some of the other things he added in. That's actually less than the level of private debt, which is running at about 165% of GDP right now. And that's the real problem. Personal debt is a mm -hmm. problem. Personal debt does constrain what individuals can do. And falls in personal debt do cause crises. That's what we should be worrying about. But all the stuff about government... Now, that is insanity, what he just said. He's... He's basically blaming everybody else besides the government. He said it's personal debt that is the problem, which, yes, yes, personal debt is a problem in the U.S., no doubt about that. And private debt, like he's saying, uh, there's companies in the stock market we know that are super over leveraged. So he's not wrong in what he's saying there, but the way he's using it to, as the cause of all of this is not accurate at all. You know, the government's the one who keeps the interest rate, the government and the Federal Reserve are the ones who keep the interest rates low to give out all this free money that people are going to go into debt. And also the government controls the schooling system and they don't teach economics or personal finances in most schools. So if the government's supposed to be in charge of educating you about the system and they fail to educate you about the system, to kind of pointing the finger at us. You know, the consumers, the retail investors, like, come on, really? Like, really? That's just a scapegoat trying to give the government no responsibility, which is insane. Government debt. And I'm talking specifically the federal debt here because federal debt is different to state debt. Uh, it doesn't doesn't have anything like the same problem. In fact, it's part of the reason why capitalism works, because when the government runs a deficit, it creates an identical surplus for the private sector. The government deficit is the private sector's surplus. If the government runs a surplus, the, the private sector runs a deficit. Uh, and if, you know, I know this is hard for people to get their heads around, but it's actually the accounting involved, and it's easily shown using accounting software, that if the government has uh, spends more than it gets back in taxes, it puts more money into private bank accounts than it takes out through taxes. And the only question is, does this end up meaning the, Federal, the Treasury has a, has a negative account at the Federal Reserve or a positive account at the Federal Reserve? That's what bond sales are for, and that's what the coin could be for as well. Okay, so to break down that insanity that he just already already but to break down that insanity that he just spoke out of his mouth that for one federal day and 
federal debt, state debt, personal debt are all different. Debt is debt, okay? If it's federal debt, yeah, it's on a bigger scale. But guess who is in charge of the federal debt? People. The state debt, yeah, that's different because it's state debt. But who's in charge of the state debt? People. So then we get down to personal debt. People. So people and debt, it's not that much different. You don't want to have a whole bunch of debt, especially wasteful debt that does not generate you any money. There's no investments that they've been really putting into uh, that is making anybody any money besides, you know, corporations and stuff with some of the crooked policies that's been enacted. He tried to absolve all responsibility off of the government and, and the state and put it on people. Sure, I, I'm sure that Peter's probably going to go off in a minute on that. That's... Uh, Peter, crazy. I want to come back to you on this because, I mean, obviously this is a broad conversation about the state of debt that we will continue here throughout the half hour. But, but the question is, what are really the negative, uh, the downsides of holding all of this debt? Because it does seem like there's a lot of give and take in this. Well, the debt is a huge problem. It doesn't help capitalism. It interferes with capitalism because what happens is the government is, is taking resources away from the private sector and diverting them to public spending. And this undermines uh, capitalism. It undermines savings and investment and all the things that we need to grow our standard of living. The problem is much of this debt now is being monetized by the central bank. The Federal Reserve prints money to buy up all this debt. And all that is is levying a massive inflation tax on the economy. And this is only getting started. Prices are gonna explode in the United States for all manner of consumer goods especially goods relative to services, because the American economy, after years and years of deficits crowding out private investment, we are completely dependent on the productive capacity of the rest of the world. We are running record trade deficits. Just yesterday, we printed the largest monthly trade deficit in U.S. history, better than $73 billion. Those deficits Jeez. are going to keep getting higher. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I hadn't seen the trade deficits yet since I've been traveling. That right there is mind-blowing. Highest trade deficits in history. Now, we have these, sh these shortages going on right now. And I, I, I kid you not, I put in a grocery order after getting back in uh, from traveling for two weeks. They didn't have any Rice Krispie Treat products. I went to the store myself, a different store, to grab some things that I couldn't get from the delivery app that I use sometimes. And I know it sounds stupid, I, do, I put an order for delivery, but the store did not have the things I need, so I just went to a different one that's closer. But anyway, there were shortages on Little Debbie snacks. Now, a lot of people have been making fun of me for the last year and a half, two years, because I've been saying bacon inflation, just watch bacon. And when the price of bacon goes up, then you know inflation is happening. And now you're seeing it. You're seeing it with the supply shortages. The cost of these cakes, these little Debbie cakes, are going to go up because there's very low supply because of the shortages, and the inflation is going to have to make them raise the prices even more. So he is dead on about goods being a problem because with those shortages, like you said, we don't make anything here. It's all made out of the U.S. and all that stuff is gets brought into us. Well, if we can't get these ships in that are outside the coast right now, then we have no products. We have no good. So, if you are not, if you weren't a boy, if you wasn't a boy scout or a girl scout, and you know don't know how to survive off of the land, or if you don't know how to clean a fish or skin a rabbit or something, it may you may be a little hungry during these volatile times. The bread is not going to be on a shelf uh, if it keeps getting bad, if, if everything gets worse. You're not going to be able to just go to the store like you normally would have everything. We saw some of that in COVID lockdown last year with toilet paper, uh, but that's going to affect way more than toilet paper. And higher, and eventually, and I think rel relatively soon, the value of our money, the dollar, is going to collapse and all the prices of the imported goods are going to be going up much faster than they are right now. And Professor Wolf, I know we have pretty much the same conversation with you quite regularly about trade and what Peter's talking about. What do you make of Peter's comments there? 
Well, I'm always mystified by Peter's comments because if this is against capitalism, he does have a problem of explaining it. Is everybody wrong except him? Is everybody making a terrible mistake? Is the system self -destructing? Most people, yes. I don't, think, I don't think so. I think this is a system that's got basic problems and is trying to solve them by printing a great deal of money and exploding its debt. It's really solving one set of problems by this debt creation by this monetization and then it creates a new set and it has bumbled through for two or three centuries doing this over and over again and everybody kind of knows that eventually you're going to solve one problem by creating another one and then you won't be able to solve it and then this well, system will come down that's the problem well, I'm well obviously Capitalism, there's not, you're not going to find in any capitalism book from any capitalist Austrian economics person that printing money is a good thing for capitalism. So I don't even know what he's talking about right there. I don't know any capitalist who is happy about money printing <laughs> unless I guess, you know, you're Peter Schiff and you've got a bunch of gold. If you got a bunch of crypto and you know the money's going to go down because they're printing, well, then yeah, you're going to make some money. But that's just being smart. That's not being happy about it. It's the Federal Reserve doing that. That's, you know, it's, the, it's not capitalism doing that. The capitalism's not printing money. So to put that on capitalism is, that's a really big conflation. That's a reach. That's like, that's a big reach. Just American just, capitalism did great until the U.S. government corrupted it. You know, we had a vibrant free market economy under a gold standard when we had honest money, when we didn't have a federal income tax or social security tax. We didn't have any of these types of spending programs that we have today. And we, have a th we had a thriving middle class. We had an economy that really was the, the envy of the world. Uh, we built a standard of living that was unmatched anywhere else in the world. The problems really started when government started to grow and started to impose more regulations and more subsidies and more government spending and the Federal Reserve came around. So these problems were not created by capitalism. They were created by government's interference with capitalism. And every time government tries to solve the problems that they create, they make those problems even worse. Well, Steve, I want to give you a chance to wait. Yeah, spot on. I mean, uh, there's nothing I can say. They, they know that. And on this, I know we've talked a lot about the different systems, but do you see the United States as having a free economy, especially when it's Congress that is deciding to continue to add on to the national debt, which they say that we own, but the American people don't really seem to have much of a choice in the matter? Oh, damn. So she made a really good point there. Remember, he was blaming it on, uh, let me move over here. He, he was blaming it on capital or on the people saying the personal debt was the problem and like she said the people really haven't had that much of a choice in it now of course you have a choice whether you open up a credit card or go take a mortgage out but the choices you have for that are not good you know if you're having to get government loans there's a lot of problems with government loans everybody knows that and they've caused prices to skyrocket in health care that's why it costs five hundred dollars for a book, a used book at, in college, that's why it costs, well, you, that's why when you get a bill from the hospital or from your doctor, you don't know what the price is until two weeks later. That's the only thing in America where you don't know the price of it before you pay for it. And you can even call them and ask them, and most of the time they won't even know until that two weeks because the insurance companies uh, or if you're a government insurance company, they have to figure it out. You know, there's basically them negotiating of how much money they will pay. And if the government's covering the bill, well, then the hospitals and everything don't have to compete, so they'll just throw out the highest numbers they can. Hey, it's great negotiation tactics. That's what you do. You negotiate. It just so happens that the government really sucks at negotiating, and entrepreneurs are really good at it. So blame that on the people. You can see she calls it out. Very, very, very smart rebuttal. I don't know if she meant to rebuttal him there, but she did. That was nice. Well, um, the American people have a choice. They can do what happened during the 1920s. And uh, let's go back. I think that's before, I think Peter would admit that's before government debt got to be particularly large. At that stage, government spending was about 5% of GDP or less. And Calvin Coolidge decided to run a, a surplus for his entire term. And during the 1920s, he did precisely that. He ran a surplus of roughly 1% of GDP every year. And of course, the economy boomed and he took credit for it and said that the surplus was the reason the economy boomed.
When you look at the data carefully, what you find is, yes, there was a government surplus of 1% of GDP every year, and every year the private sector was borrowing roughly 5% of GDP to speculate on the stock market. Now, that's what gave you the turbocharged economy, not the surplus, but the, the, the government, but the deficit being run that by was the only private. Yeah, I was, about, I was about to comment on what he was saying just now, but Peter's just ready to jump in there, so I'll just listen to what To he borrow says. and gamble, let me finish, Peter, to borrow and gamble on the stock market, and over that period of time, the private debt level rose, more margin debt, okay, just but debt to buy, to gamble on shares, rose from 1% of GDP to 13% of GDP, and then crash right back down again. That's what gave us the Great Depression. Now, that sort of irresponsibility on the private debt side is the real uh, Achilles heel of capitalism. And worrying about the government's behavior is frankly identifying the wrong problem. And Peter, I'm gonna give you the final word. You have 30 seconds. So still, yeah, he's blatantly saying none of this is the government's fault. None of it. None. He's taking all responsibility off of the government. Now, this is the interest, the interesting thing. He's blaming people. And like I said, the government is just people. So he's saying it's people's fault that all this is happening. Well, yeah, you're exactly right. But who, which people is it? And to put it all on the consumer and hard work in America, that's, I mean, it's just insanity what he's saying. Like, I don't... And he went and picked like one specific stat out to back his whole point. It sounded really good, sounded really smart, but you can't just talk about economics with one single pinpointed stat to talk about all of it. There's too many different things. So that's just, yeah. I guess before we go to break here. Yeah, the problem was the Federal Reserve was in, uh, created in 1913, and it was their easy money policies in the latter part of the 1920s that inflated that stock market bubble. And when it popped, what created the Depression was the interventionist policies of Herbert Hoover and, the, and then Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That's why we had a Depression, was because we had too much government and we had a, and we had a central bank. <laughs> if, we, if we didn't have either, then we wouldn't have had a Depression at all. All right, I know we've and got we a lot to talk about. Oh, see, they're all shaking their heads. But this guy was saying the problem started in 1920. Well, Peter Schiff went back and was like, no, it started in 1913 when the government and it got bigger and the Federal Reserve started. So if you can trace it back further and there was government interference first, then obviously it wasn't the people speculating. I mean, yeah, the Wall Street is going to be responsible for some of that, but Remember, Wall Street works inside of the system of the government. The government creates the rules and the regulations. So anything Wall Street does, the government has let them do, right? It's actually astonishing to see here listening to the two socialists take all responsibility completely off the government, which, of course, they're going to because that's what socialists want. They want bigger governments, at least any I've talked to, never heard of any of them um, that want smaller government, so that kind of goes defeats the purpose of socialism. Stock market bubble. <laughs> you can shake your head, but that's that's a fact. And for more on this, let's bring back our panel of Professor Richard Wolf, host of Economic Update, Peter Schiff, chief economist at Euro Pacific Capital, and Steve Keen, the economics professor of Patreon. Uh, Steve, I actually want to start with what Ben just mentioned there. As you see a nation, I just want to point this out. I said it twice, and I'm just not kind of understanding it. This guy here is the uh, economics professor of Patreon. If you don't know what Patreon is, uh, it's a social media website. <laughs> There's some other things I could point out, too. I'll point out in a second. But it's a social media website for influencers uh, like me, like him, apparently. Uh, anybody who has a following online, you can monetize that following. So, I mean, it, I don't know if he's self-proclaimed uh, economics professor of Patreon or who gave him that title but uh, yeah it's just words and obviously clearly you see the difference between this guy's background you know capitalist background uh, versus the socialist background coat hanger here like a bunch of stuff on his chair I mean this this background is I mean, I don't know. Like, you like you couldn't have spent twenty dollars. You know, you like to do a lot of spending. You want to spend all the taxpayers' money on programs and all of that, but you you couldn't spend your own twenty dollars just to make your background look nice. 
Like, come on, look, there's a little dirt on his mic too, bro. Come on, come on. Now, at least Wolf and and Wolf, you know, they've not really let him talk that much so far, which I wish they would, because Wolf would give Schiff a better run than this guy's giving Schiff. And you just see the look on Peter's face. He's like, this is just this is just a cakewalk. Uh, but these two have debated before and got into it pretty heated. So I would like to see him more. And he at least has the decency to have a nice background there instead of uh, your hot pot and your crafts of your art crafts here on your chair in the background. But hey, you know, teach their own. In default or face major debt woes, and then they're owing 44% of their GDP to creditors. What is that doing to them? Depends on whether they have their own currency or not, and whether they're running a trade surplus or not. A country running a trade surplus, and let's take Japan as an example there, is quite capable of continuing to issue government debt indefinitely. Uh, in, on that particular case, the Japan indefinitely is a strong Japan, word. I think has the world record 250 percent of GDP is its government debt level is the economy suffering no on a per capita basis has been growing faster than the United States uh, for most of the last 15 years well we've <laughs> that was a bad point we're talking about how bad the US has been run so to compare a, comp a country as small as Japan just geopolitically is not a good example it, the resources and land mass of the United States versus Japan is a huge difference. And then also the way that America has been run the past 20, 30 years, that's literally what we're talking about. So then they go and say, oh, yeah, Japan is doing better than America. I mean, obviously, you know, that's not a that's not a point to back his argument at all. Now, if, I, if Peter Schiff had something, had said something, I know it looks like I'm just backing Peter Schiff this whole time, but literally, they, Wolf, I did give some credit on that one, but I'm not going to give anybody credit for talking nonsense. So, <laughs> you know, if you think I'm talking nonsense, let me know in the comments. I will debate anybody. But Years, uh, and it can do it indefinitely because with a trade surplus as well, it's not selling its its bonds to foreigners, and foreigners, if they are, if they do buy those bonds, are quite happy to be paid in Japanese yen. Now, if the problems arise for countries which are running trade deficits, which can't borrow in their own currency. They're the ones who are up, you know, the, the proverbial creek without a paddle. Uh, but when, when you have a country which is either running a trade surplus like Japan or in America's case, which is unfortunately, and it should not be, is unfortunately the reserve currency for the planet, that you can get away with it indefinitely. So again, we're worrying about the wrong things. Now, Professor Wolf, I mean, when it comes to debt between... Yeah, that's insanity. Saying that America can continue to print money and do what we're doing indefinitely, it's not working now. That's why we're having the conversation because all the money printing and all this is not working now. We're having record inflation and all these problems. So the fact we're even having this conversation and then he's saying that, oh, it doesn't matter. We're talking about the wrong thing. I mean, what should we be talking about then? What, what, are, we, what are we missing here? more developed nations it really is a delicate balance with a lot of give and take in some cases is having ongoing national de debt actually healthy no in most cases this is just a kind of continuation of old colonialism and imperialism under a slightly adjusted set of circumstances. Instead of literally carrying the gold out of the country uh, somewhere in Africa back to Europe or over to the United States or ripping off the local people to make them work for next to nothing, you are now doing it with loans. You're giving them a loan, you're greasing the wheels of the loan with large amounts of fees and commissions and I won't even speak about the corruption that is going on on both sides so you end up with very little of that money going into any kind of long-term progressive economic growth and so the burden of the debt is not matched by a, a, an ability to pay for it so it becomes these crazy numbers that Ben just went over and this is terribly bad for these poor countries already deepens the inequalities in the world and creates political and social instability that we will all be regretting uh, every week and month into the future. Now, I agree with most of that. I mean, I don't know how far you want to go back and call it imperialism. Uh, there's probably a debate there. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's he's admitting that the currency problems, uh, a lot of the problems are causing inequities. But you know, the problem is the government's, or she even admitted, fiat currencies uh, by smaller countries get into trouble easily by printing money. Then yeah, you know, I agree with a lot of what he said there. And Peter, I want to kind of make a counterpoint here that I think might, you will have a great answer to here, because could this global debt issue result, or should it for that matter, result in a destabilization of fiat currency so much that governments and citizens will be forced to actually rely on other means? You often talk about the gold standard. Obviously, on this show, we regularly talk about cryptocurrency as an alternative to fiat. What do you make of all of that? Well, certainly. First of all, you know, while it's true that governments can certainly get away with having too much debt for a while, and, and some, you know, can do it for a long while, no government can do it indefinitely. There's always going to be a, a day of reckoning. But the important thing to, to look at, too, with the debt is why do we have so much debt? I mean, it's not an accident. You have global central banks led by the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates artificially low, and it's because inter interest rates... Uh and that's not speculation. They are. They've told us they're keeping interest rates low on purpose. Trades are artificially low that there's so much debt. And the problem, too, with the debt is that it's not productive. You have individuals borrowing money to buy consumer goods. You have mm -hmm. corporations borrowing money to buy back their overpriced stock. You don't have productive debt where we're buying, investing in plant and equipment that is actually generating real income to service and retire the debt. You have this gigantic speculative bubble. You have asset bubbles all over the place. None of this is a byproduct of capitalism. It's all because of the failure to have capitalism. If we had capitalism and sound money, we would have much higher interest rates. We wouldn't have all this debt. We'd have a much more prosperous economy. But to answer your question, yes, all of this is leading to a currency crisis that will begin in the United States as both a sovereign debt crisis and a U.S. dollar crisis, and it will unle unleash you know, rampant inflation throughout the world, and ultimately, a lot of this debt is going to be inflated away. I mean, the debt can't be paid, and yeah. so most governments don't have the integrity to honestly default, and it's going to get wiped out through inflation. And then where we go in the aftermath of that is difficult to say. But the world is going to go through a very, very difficult period because a lot of these paper, paper wealth is going to mm -hmm. get wiped out. So a lot of people that think they have money invested in bonds, you know, government bonds, corporate bonds, whatever they got, they're going to find out they have very little because the purchasing power is going to be eviscerated because the cost of living is going to surge. And, you know, they, they, they're locked into the paper and they don't have any way to pay the higher costs. Now, Steve, what yeah, so that was all pretty spot on. And that goes back to like I was saying, prices of goods are going up. And both of them were shaking their heads while he was saying this. If they are only invested in cash, which I high well, this guy may only be invested in cash, but I highly doubt Richard Wolf is only in cash. I like to see their portfolios to see what they're in. Because if you want to leave your money in cash, but because you you think that America is too big to fall, you go ahead and take that risk. That I would much rather stay in cash and day trade a low float trash can stock than take that type of risk. <laughs> what is your response to this? I mean, I know we've talked a lot about the bubbles that are coming up, but I mean, are we facing a global crisis on the scale that Peter is referencing here? Um, I can't help thinking of what I was told once is the, the way you get punished in an American jail if you're really misbehaving, and that is rather than giving you a plate with, uh, you know, meat and vegetables and, and stuff on it, they put it in a blender and blend the whole lot together and serve it to you, and apparently it tastes yuck. Uh, okay, so this guy apparently has never been to an American jail. I have. That's not accurate at all. I never had blended food while I was in jail. <laughs> is the food great? No, it's terrible. But put it in a blender and blend it like jails aren't paying the money to have blenders in the first place to souffle people's food. So that it, that was just dumb. You, yeah, you just talk that blatantly talking out of the ass. Even though individual units uh, can be quite quite 
delicious individually. Uh, Peter's thrown a whole lot of stuff in the blender there. And some of it, yes, is, is a serious worry. Others, no, is not at all the problem. In fact, it's a necessary part of a functioning capitalist economy. We do have too much private debt. Far too much of the debt has been used to speculate on asset prices and not produce productive investment. Uh, that's quite true. Uh, but as for defaults being caused by government debt, the only time that happened with governments borrow in a currency which is not their own. That's what's caused government defaults. When you look at the last 150 years, there have been roughly 150 financial crises in different countries around the world, and every last one of them has been caused by private debt collapse. So it's private debt which is the well, problem, government debt is which is often the default. solution. Yeah. Uh, Hyperinflation is going to probably possibly, if it happens, it'll be the courtesy of the supply shocks from the collapse of the global supply chain, not from what's happening with no, monetary it's because dynamics. Of, it's because of too much money creation. That's mm. what causes it. It's a loss you of know, confidence but, but it's, in fiat it, money. And Peter, if, uh, Professor Wolf, yeah, you have the final word here. Yeah, so what Peter's basically saying is, and this is the literal definition of inflation, when you add money into the money supply, it causes inflation. You inflate a balloon, you add an air into the air supply of that balloon to inflate it. Same thing with money. That's the simple definition of inflation. And I mean, I don't know how you get around that by saying what he just said. That's crazy, but okay. Yeah, you know, the story that Peter starts with is those low interest rates that enable uh, corporations to borrow. But why start there? Why not ask the question, why the low interest rates? It was a decision of the Fed to which almost everyone agreed that we were on the edges of a disastrous collapse in the, in the dot-com crisis in 2000, again in the Great Recession of 2008, again last year. Interest rates are lowered because you would have the collapse mm -hmm. that Peter's talking no. about if you the didn't do it. But then you the saw, well, let me, let me just finish. When when you, when you solve the problem with the money, yeah, you create a new problem that is going to be right. perhaps even bigger than the old one. But you have uh, to right. solve each problem as it comes no, along no, we have because to this system is so gentlemen, fragile. Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, unfortunately, we are out of time in this show. This is a conversation we will have to. So I don't know if there was more of that, but apparently that's what Peter Schiff had posted on his channel. If there's more of that discussion that you happen to find, let me know. Drop it in the comments. Uh, it was nice to see him stay civil for a while. Of course, you get capitalists and socialists in a room. They just cannot agree. It's two totally different perspectives. And I just cannot agree with those socialist points of taking all the responsibility off of the government. Like you're going to put it on all the regular people, but you're not going to put it on the other people who are in charge of the regular people. You know, we elect people into power to represent us and represent our interests. So if they're not representing our interest and doing what they're supposed to be doing to make the economy better, which is basically stay out of it, uh, then, yeah, it's going to be the government's fault. It's going to be the people who are supposed to be representing our interests, not representing our interests. I would have liked to see Wolf talk a little bit more but that's always his stance is that it's not the government's fault in any way, shape, or form, even though he admitted that the Federal Reserve caused a lot of problems. Well, it's the Federal Reserve, not the free market reserve. So there was some points that Wolf made that were okay. The other guy is one of those people I think that is so smart that they're actually kind of dumb because they do extra research. He, he could win probably in a debate in a crowd full of people who know nothing about economics because he was pulling specific statistics to back what he was saying. But it, they're so specific of statistics that you can't just go off of that one little statistic when looking at the whole entire geopolitical, political, and economic climate right now. There's just too much going on across the board in every sector to go, oh, this one thing here is why this one thing is happening. Now, it's a culmination, and that goes back to his reference of the blender reference that he made, uh, which was just nonsense. I agree with Peter Schiff on most of it. Definitely a lot of blame to go on the government, but people in general just have to be more intelligent. They have to do their own research because the government's not going to do it for you. They never have, and they never will they're not going to hold your hand through life. 
If you expect them to do that, then you're in for a rude awakening. And I do think that things are going to get worse. We are seeing all this stuff that I've been talking about starting to really play out. Oil prices skyrocketing. Uh, the U.S. dollar getting shaky. It's had some pops trying to come back up. But overall, we've been inflating the money supply and the U.S. dollar is on a downtrend since at least 1986. And we've got gold, silver, all this on uptrends. Oil as well. Oil is probably going to be $100 a barrel soon, just breaking up to 82 60 I expect prices on everything to continue to go up, especially goods. And the U.S. dollar is to continue to go down. We're going to see a breakdown in the fabric of society as the people get more desperate, as things times get harder. There's a lot of financial miseducation or non-education, and everybody who is not educated are going to get destroyed. So share this video. Go share the original video. Share videos about economics in general, whether they're from my channel or any other channel. Shout out to Boomer Bust for having those guys on there. And even though I disagree with a lot of what the one guy said and what Wolf says, I still respect them for getting on there and doing that. So kudos to them for that. And again, if you would like to see more content like this, me reacting to economic videos, maybe even some political economic videos, whatnot, hit that like button and say more reactions in the, in the comments down below. Appreciate everybody joining me as always. Stay safe out there. Until next time.